Hello, I'm Tyler Bates. I am a flight surgeon, and I am here providing you with some of the important information that you need regarding military match and military medicine, most specifically about the Air Force. Today's episode is honestly just a little bit of miscellaneous items. Uh, the first one that I'm going to start out with is something that has bit multiple people in the butt. I actually touched upon it in the last episode that was focused on the intern year positions, but those of you that don't have to do intern years, uh, hopefully you're watching this one so that you get this important news. It is in your contract that you must have an unrestricted medical license by the end of your intern year. It doesn't matter what state it is. It doesn't have to be in the state of where your residency program is. It doesn't have to be where you hope to get assigned, but you have to have one. As I mentioned, I'm licensed in Indiana. It was 200 bucks for two years and they process things really quick. And that's actually why the majority of military members are actually licensed out of Indiana. Uh, props to them for doing something and getting all of that business. But it doesn't matter if you are just doing an intern year, if you're doing family medicine, internal medicine, or even neurosurgery, and you're going to be around for seven years, it really doesn't matter. You have to have a license by the end of your first year. Historically, they have pulled some people out of their residency programs and told them to get to work. Um, so just, just do it. And if it's where your residency program is and they allow moonlighting, which you are allowed to do if you are civilian deferred because everything is run by your program. But if you are civilian sponsored or you are active duty, you are not allowed to moonlight. Just a little FYI. I want to talk a little bit about commitments. Typically, and I admit my bias here, I don't know the intricacies of a uh, single person move uh, as I am married and so my wife is considered a dependent. There's a little bit extra time commitment necessary with a move. But if you are moving, your first assignment, anytime you move in the military, you need to be on site for two years. There's a couple little intricacies and ways that you can get released, but two years. However, if you want to go from stateside to stateside, or as we refer to CONUS, uh, Continental US, it actually requires you to be four years in place before you can PCS or permanent change of station move. Um, so you are required to be in place for four years if you want to go somewhere else within the US. Uh, they do allow you to do this earlier if you want to go somewhere that really needs people and isn't highly competitive to get there. Um, and you've got to be at kind of a cush location yourself that somebody's going to be willing to come in, but it's got to be after the two years. So I can't say that it's impossible for you to move somewhere stateside within four years, but um, you're going to have to be really lucky that somebody's going to want to take your spot and you're going to probably be wanting to actually be going to a place that is less desired than the place that you are already at. It might be more desirable for you. In that case, it's going to be a cush system. However, if you want to go overseas, you have to be two years in your first assignment, and then you can go overseas. If you are single, the overseas tour length, I believe, is two years. If you are married with or without kids, it's three years because they had to move an extra person out there. They want to make sure that they're getting their money's worth from you, uh, having you in that place, or at least that's the way I look at it. Um, whether or not that's the reason that it is there. This also applies for going to residency. You want to do ophthalmology. You don't end up matching. You roll on into flight medicine. During your time in flight medicine, you're going to have some fantastic experiences. You are going to have a sweet application. Hopefully, you're going to get it the next time. But you can't directly apply the next year. You have to be apply one year following that. Um, just because it's the two year time on station. Uh, there's other intricacies of getting into leadership. Uh, leadership roles have different uh, time commitments associated with them. Uh, but that's something to talk about in the future, because those of you that are thinking, am I going to be a GMO or a general medical officer internship trained only, or trying to get your first assignment probably aren't quite thinking about your leadership tours uh, just yet. 
Mill to mill, speaking of moving, is a way that you can end up moving a little bit earlier if you are married to a military spouse. I will say that it seems difficult. I'm not mill to mill. People make it work within medicine and within medicine. Uh, you're going to have limitations as to who's able to take both. If you are in medicine and your spouse is not within medicine, you're still limited on what base has a job for your spouse and has a job for you. It gets tricky. Um, hopefully you can find somebody that is mill to mill uh, and they would be able to help you. Money. Who doesn't like talking about money? Um, well, I guess it depends on how frustrated you are about money. When you graduate from medical school, you become a captain. That is when the time for your pay starts. You will take your orders in when you arrive on active duty, especially if you've been deferred, and you're going to be like, here, I'm starting. And they're going to count from the date that you commissioned in medical school. And you're going to be rolling in the dough. Get that corrected ASAP. Also look and see. Um, I can tell you the captain at zero years versus the captain at four years was a thousand dollar difference when I entered. Every paycheck, I was putting 500 bucks aside because, you know, two paychecks a month, thousand dollars a month difference. I was putting that aside because when they finally got it fixed about three, four months later, um, after enough visits to finance and personnel to get things figured out. Uh, so advocate for yourself. Make sure you do it. Advocate for yourself. Make sure that gets corrected. Um, then I had a paycheck that was like 23 bucks. And I needed the stuff that was in savings. Um, at least they told me at that time that I couldn't write a check and just get it. They had to recuperate it from my paycheck. I was a little bummed because that meant that I was no longer able to contribute to the TSP during that time. The TSP is basically the government form of 401k. It's actually fantastic. It's one of the cheapest ones and extremely productive. I highly recommend putting in at least the 5% that you get matched. It's fully vested. You're able to take it with you. Um, it's a great system. The old legacy system is that you had to serve 20 years. Once you hit the 20 years, you could retire at half of your base pay. But the people like myself who only plan on four years basically have four years and nothing to show in the retirement bucket. So they fix that. And now I will have four years of a 5% match in the IRA. Make sure you get that one set up. Um, a future video, I will hopefully go way into more depth. Uh, this is a very important thing to talk about, but the GI Bill, you qualify for the GI Bill. Um, and if you are like me and a GMO and going back to residency, you can qualify for the GI Bill. There's two different types, post 9-11 and Montgomery GI. You qualify for both. I paid in for the Montgomery GI because when you get out, it's at least $2,000 a month of tax-free money. The post 9-11 will give you E5 uh, BAH. Um, and pay for all of your tuition, but in residency, you don't have tuition. Um, so I'm looking forward to the $2,000 a month bonus through residency. Uh, so make sure you get that taken care of. Think about that. Montgomery GI, you have to pay in $100 a month for 12 months. So $1,200 versus $2,000 a month for three years. Math is not my strongest quality, but that's uh, pretty resounding to make the investment um, personally. And there's more information about that. I will hopefully cover that in a future video, uh, but just be cognizant and aware of that. Um, but let's talk about day-to-day -day money. So Captain, zero, well, one year by the time you enter. And then you get a medical bonus. Medical bonus as it stands now is $20,000 annually divided over each month. So you get an extra uh, $1,600 a month. And that you have to fill out the paperwork to start in October, unfortunately, three months after you complete your training for all medical bonuses, as far as my understanding is. Um, and that comes into a problem when you're looking to separate just because your end active duty service commitment is probably going to be June or July based off of whenever you entered if you sign that in October and you keep renewing it, you have to renew it annually for GMOs. You keep renewing it. You get to your second to last year. You sign it in October. And that's now extended your date out into October. So watch out for that. Be prepared for that. Be saving money at the beginning because it looks like the last nine months 
you're not going to be getting any of the medical bonus, which is actually a pretty good bonus to have and definitely helps the paycheck. My last little trick and tip is more of a tip or honestly thing that I wish that I did. When you are preparing to come on active duty, usually around December-ish time frame, your assignments officer will reach out to you, will say, hey, here's a list of the bases that we are going to need you at. For flight surgeons, it's uh, here's a list of every single base and you need to rank 20 of them. If you have somewhere where you really, 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 really want to go, or that you really, really, really don't want to go, um, I don't know, options up to you, not only work with your assignments officer, but reach out to the consultant. So in my case, I wish that I had reached out to the consultant for aerospace medicine earlier, um, and maybe my initial assignment would have been kept. I was uh, informed about six weeks prior to entering active duty that they had changed my assignment from my first choice assignment uh, to an assignment that I hadn't even ranked. And if I had maybe worked with the assignments office, or if I had actually worked with the functional in addition to the assignments officer, that may or may not have happened. I don't know. Uh, but the recommendation, I recommend reaching out to both of them. Well, that is the end of my series for now. But as I alluded to, I will be coming back in some future time to talk about the GI Bill. GI Bill, fantastic resource. Uh, I need to get a little bit more information about the intricacies of that, but expect that one later and look for a future episode about some of the job duties of a flight surgeon, some of the things that I do day to day. So if you are interested in keeping up with those other things, uh, please go ahead, hit that subscribe button, share this with your friends that are also in military medicine. Hopefully, it is something that can be beneficial. So you're aware the things that I'm saying are my opinion and do not represent the official position of the U.S. Air Force, U.S. Department of Defense, Defense Health Agency, or U.S. Government. Thank you for joining us on Musculoskeletal Minute. We have your back. Please remember that this is for education and does not constitute medical advice. Please subscribe, leave us a positive review, and share with your friends.